Do you remember in the very first video lecture um, for this course when I talked about um, the one of the major themes of Western poetry being what is the use of the world? And I defined the world as money, power, sex, and fame. Um, and the world, you know, the, the medieval Latin word for world is seculum. This is where we get secular from, right? And it's a wor word that exists not in its own, but as, um, you know, there is no secular without the sacred. The term secular itself is def defined in contrast to the divine, to the sacred, and in um, uh, pre-modern culture, it's, it's the derivative, derivative term, it's the secondary term, but it's also, um, John Donne is living in the 17th century. This is the age of, the, of Descartes, um, of, of Francis Bacon, of the beginning of the scientific method, of the beginning of global exploration, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Leibniz, the invention of the calculus, uh, the beginning of double entry bookkeeping. I mean, done is early for some of this stuff, but this is, these are the trends of the 17th century in which this world, um, the secular, is beginning to move into a more ascendant position in value relative to the sacred. Um, this has been something that's been going on gradually since the 14th century, but really kind of um, the ramp starts steepening. Uh, if that's, is that a word? Yeah, who cares? Um, here, language isn't a prison um, here in, in, in the 17th century. Where am I going with this? I'm talking about um, how John Donne uses his poetry to make something sacred out of love. And what does it mean to make love sacred? Well, it's to make something love, it's to make love something that is not part of the world, but apart from it, beyond it, above it, something that transcends it. And this theme we already saw in The Sun Rising, but it's really sort of emphasized in a number of his poems, but one of the more famous ones is the canonization, which is a rejection of the world in favor of love. This is his articulation of the value of love as something sacred. So let's have a look. Once again, this poem begins in a mode of address, an, an apostrophe, talking to somebody who's, who's not there or who's not principally concerned. It begins, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love or chide my palsy or my gout, my five gray hairs or ruined fortune flout. With wealth your state, your mind, with arts, improve. Take you a course, get you a place. Observe his honor, or his grace, or the king's real, or his stamped face. Contemplate. What you will approve, so you will let me love. In other words, shut up, leave me alone. Make fun of me being sick. Chide my palsy or my gout, or, or the fact that I'm getting old or the fact that I've screwed up my life. And we've already talked about that in the introductory uh, um, lecture on, on Dunn. Or, you know, my ruined fortune flout. Note the poetic inversion there. Another poetic inversion. With wealth, your state. Your mind, with arts, improve. This is uh, a device called a zugma, right? Improve your state with wealth. Improve your mind with arts. This is the kind of a twisted syntax that the later neoclassical poets would not like so much. Take you a course. <laughs> um, and the course here doesn't mean a college course necessarily, but um, a career. You know, uh, you know, take up a career, get you a place, get a position in the government or something like that. Observe his honor or his grace. These two hises are not necessarily the same people, but it's like, you know, go be a courtier, go be an official. Uh, Go serve the real king or his stamped face, and that means um, money. Go be a merchant, right, or his stamped face. That is a coin with the king's face on it. Contemplate. What you will approve. What you will here means what you want. The word want often has the meaning, uh, will often has the meaning, not of futurity in early modern English, but of simple desire. Um, what you will approve. And approve is the sen has the sense of, of uh, you know, what it means now, but also try out, do, like, pursue. But leave me alone. 
let me love. So you will let me love. And the let has the sense of letting alone, right? Let me love. Leave me alone to love. And then he develops this argument, right? Why, you, why should you do this? Alas, alas, who's injured by my love? What merchant's ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my colds a forward spring remove? And there he's making a, a joke about the, um, the stereotypical effects on the body of the lover, that you feel cold and heat. Remember the, the icy heat uh, from the, the paradox of, of Petrarch and love here? That's such an old tradition that he can just kind of refer to it casually as this kind of offhand, worn-out garment that he's putting on in a way. When did my colds a forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? Plaguey bill is a haunting word here because the plaguey bill was the, a bill was a list or a petition or, or a print, any kind of printed document. And it was, um, the plague came in 1348, but it never went away. There were periodic waves of plague that ravaged Europe into the 18th century. And the plaguey bill was the list of people whose names died, uh, the name of people who, who died of the plague that would be posted in public places. So when did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? And I'm, I, I'm just dwelling on this plaguey bill business because it is such a, a touch of darkness and realism that really has, you couldn't imagine it in Spencer's um, Amoretti or, or Sidney's Astrophil and Stella it would be hard even to imagine it in Shakespeare's sonnets, which are a little more down to earth. Um, this is a poetry that really kind of hits on the real, it really um, has its eye open to this uh, kind of like work, work a day experience. Um, and, and it's talking about the contrast between that experience and this experience of love, which is now imagined as this, as this private world, this private universe. It doesn't, it's not the lover lost in his solipsistic kind of haze that we see in Petrarch and other of the, the, the love sonneteers going through the centuries, but it's, it's sort of a recognition that his love is private and individual. And it's so interesting that he's writing at the same time as, as Descartes and, and Bacon and others who, where there's this new sort of attention or focus on one's experience of being in the world as subjective, private, individual. And here's that contrast again between the world, the public, and his own personal experience, his own personal love affair. Soldiers find wars, and lawyers find out still litigious men which quarrels move, though she and I do love. So all this is going on in the world, the merchant ships, the plaguey bills, soldiers and lawyers, it has nothing to do with me. Me and her are loving more of this argument. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Call her one, me another fly. And by fly here he means a house fly, which are associated both with um, uh, moral turpitude, sort of like rot, you know, what do we think of when we think of flies? We think of like dirtiness or rottenness or and also short-livedness, right? So go ahead and call us, call her one, meet another fly. Flies are associated with lust in the early modern period in the same way that we kind of euphemistically connect the birds and the bees, um, right? Flies reproduce rapidly in a great number. So call her one, meet another fly. We're tapers too, and at, at our own cost die. We in us find the eagle and the dove, the phoenix riddle, hath more wit. By us, we two being one, are it. So to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. We die and rise the same, and prove mysterious by this love. In this third stanza, Dunn has made a shift now. He's, he's, he's stopped saying, leave us alone, um, in our own little private world of love, and he's opened up something about this private world uh, world of love. 
and he does it through a few conceits. Remember, conceits, these, these elaborate and unlikely metaphors. First, we're flies, buzz, buzz. Also, we're tapers. And a taper is a candle. And a candle, by its own cost, dies. Now, this is um, a dense sexual metaphor, too, because um, dying and expense are both early modern euphemisms for orgasm. And there was a medical theory that your life was shortened, that you kind of used up your life force in when you orgasmed, right? Um, and so the, 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 the conceit here compares sexual pleasure to being a candle um, so that you're at your own cost you die. And that die is working in multiple levels. So that's one thing that's going on there. What this, what's this about the phoenix riddle, though? Well, the phoenix, as you might know, either from Harry Potter or from uh, that Kanye West video, um, is a bird that burns up and then is reborn out of its own ashes. And so there's that, there's that uh, um, suggestion of death and rebirth, which has a sacred aspect, but also has that sexual aspect involving, you know, you die and then you get up again. Uh, I think we talked about that with Shakespeare's Sonnet 73. Um, and also, in the phoenix, the eagle and the dove, symbols of both loyalty and um, conquest, uh, become one, right? And so, um, we two being one are it. So to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. Neutral is from a Latin word meaning neither, right? There's this idea of absolute union, that where they transgen, tra transcend their gender. We die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love. Death and resurrection, but referring to sex. There is something maybe sacrilegious about this. And how is it that I can say that he's saying that love is not part of the world when the world in this Christian worldview and in the pre-modern worldview is money, power, sex, and fame? Here he is talking about sex. Dr. Newman, what do, you, what do you mean this isn't about the world? This is entirely about the world. This is entirely about physical pleasure. Maybe. Let's, let's read on. We can die by it, if not live by love. And if unfit for tombs and hearse our legend be, it will be fit for verse. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms. As well a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs, and by these hymns all shall approve us canonized for love. So now he's turned the conceit a different way, or he's, he's developing a new conceit here. Um, if we if we die and can't live by love, and if our if we're not fit for tombs in a hearse, that is for like a grand state funeral, it will be fit for verse. And here he's make, he's appealing to this old humanistic idea of poetry as a monument, right? Um, uh, the Horace wrote in, the, in ancient Rome, and um, Dante quoted him, Out of a mouthful of broken air, I will make a monument more lasting than bronze. I like how Dunn says, no, not, what turns this, no, just a, not a monument more lasting than bronze, a pretty room, a well-wrought urn. A, a, you know, an urn is a funereal, like, um, vase type thing. If you've ever played Skyrim, you go around opening a lot of them and finding like three gold pieces. Um, the, as well as a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs. Um, John Dunn, you always do this to me. I'm suddenly remembering that ashes in early modern English would have, might possibly have been pronounced asses. Um, oh, John Dunn. Um, yeah, okay. By these hymns all shall approve us canonized for love. What does it mean to be canonized? To be canonized is to be sainted. So there's this idea that we are saints of love. We are martyrs to love. Um, and therefore, people will sing hymns to us. They will pray and they will invoke us. You whom reverend love made one another's hermitage, that is like a monastery. You and what is a monastery but a place where you withdraw from the world, right? And there's that, that persistent theme in Dunn of withdrawing from the world into this private place of love. You whom reverend love made one another's hermitage, you to whom love was peace that now is rage, who did the whole world's soul contract 
and drove into the glasses of your eyes, so made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomize countries, towns, courts, beg from above a pattern of your love. You, who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of your eyes. Countries, towns, and courts beg from above a pattern for your love. With these big complicated sentences in early modern poetry, you gotta look for your, your verb. Um, you beg. Again, he's in that, that mode of address. This is the main verb, this is the command. Everything here, that is um, uh, parenthetical. So always look for what is the main part of your sentence. You to whom loveless peace that now is rage. I love that, the paradox. Who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of your eyes, so made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomize. What is that even? Well, to epitomize is to make an image, and to be a spy is to sort of give information away so that um, the, uh, the, the people who were enemies of their love may, uh, made their whole world contract as they looked into each other and became each other's whole world, that their um, eyes become the mirrors of love itself, and they themselves become the images of love, which is associated with this idea of image of the, the image of the saint, which is venerated by Catholics. Now, Dunn is not a Catholic, although he, may, he came from a Catholic family, so he's drawing on the energy of Catholic spiritual ideas, but transposing them into a place where they're both safe, um, and also uh, because it's not really about anything important, it's just about love, and part of, one of, part of the joke of Dunn is that he can say these vastly um, grand things about love because it's not a matter of public importance. And he is always playing with that, um, that contrast and in, 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 inverting the values of the world. And in doing so, he's doing something that's sort of sac sacrilegious, but also, I think, very sincerely arguing that love has a kind of sacredness that, you know, and I think there is something in Dunn that I think um, elevates sex above love. I think this isn't, these are poems that um, manage, that try to have their cake and eat it. That it's not, um, it's moving past Petrarch. It's rejecting the idea of the Petrarchan idea that, um, that physical love and physical desire are uh, failures, that you haven't achieved, achieved that pure Neoplatonic kind of spirituality. He, um, he, the lovers in John Donne's poems seem to come through this kind of intense spirituality, this this transcendent, um, this transcendence of the body, right? Uh, where where you rise above even being a sexed thing, you die and rise the same. We are one. We are united. We are mysterious. That word mysterious has religious connotations, referring to the transmutation of the Eucharist. Um, so he's playing. He's he's playing with. He's sacrileging, but he's, he's sacrileging Catholic ideas, which is a safe thing to do in Protestant early modern England. But, he, but there's still that religious energy that he's using to fashion this very strong um, expression of love and its value. And that's the canonization.